بچوں کو عطا کر لی اصغر کا تبا سوم بوڑوں کو حبیب ابن مظاہر کی نظر دے کم سن کو ملے بل ماں کو سکھا سانی زہرا کا سلیقہ بہنوں کو سکینوں کی دعاوں کا اثر دے جو چادر زینب کی ازادار ہے مولا محفوظ رہے ایسی قواتین کے پردے جاتی ہے آج نہ آئے جو دین کے کام آئے وہ اولاد عطا کر جو مجھے السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ to request you to recite Surah Fatiha for Marhum Jafar Ali Bhai Khawar Fatiha Bismillahi Rahmani Rahim In the name of Allah, the merciful, the compassionate All praises to Allah, the creator of the universes and their sustainer, the provider of believers and unbelievers. And may his choicest blessings be on the seal of his prophets, the last of his messengers and his holy progeny. And in particular, may his incessant blessings ever continue to flow on the ninth successor to the holy prophet, on Imam Abu Jafar Muhammad ibn Ali in al Jawad, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. Last night we were considering proofs of the Imama of uh, Imam Jawad alayhi salam and we moved on from, from the time of the martyrdom of uh, Imam Rada alayhi salam to the time Ma'amun Planatullah alayhi called over the Imam alayhi salam to Baghdad. <coughs> But even in that intervening period, as I said yesterday, a number of events took place to establish his imama. For example, for example, a group of people who had proceeded on pilgrimage in that year, on completion of the pilgrimage, as is usual, moved on to Medina, 
and at Medina they attended the house of Ridha alayhi salam to meet his successor <coughs> and on arrival they were made to meet Abdullah bin Musa ibn Ja'far that is the, the, the brother of Imam Ridha alayhi salam and he, he claimed to be in place of Imam Ridha alayhi salam and so the pilgrims particularly those from Qum asked him a number of questions he of course was not able to answer them some he was not able to answer at all others he was not able to answer satisfactorily and as a result the pilgrims who got there were very dissatisfied they were assured that he was not imam of the type they always knew an imam to be for example there were those who were accustomed to Imam Kazim alayhi salam and the way he answered those questions and then Ar-Ridha alayhi salam himself and they certainly were in, in the expectation that his successor would be a match to him and he would be able to perform and answer questions exactly as his father used to. But when they saw the brother and the brother was not able to match Ar-Ridha alayhi salam they obviously got very dissatisfied and stood up to leave being sure that they haven't met their Imam of the time. And when that happened, an announcer came out and said that the true successor to Ar-Ridha alayhi salam, that is his, say, his son, Muhammad ibn Ali ibn al-Jawad salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi, will soon appear. And in no time, he appeared and sat there. All those questions were repeated to him. And he answered them all, not only swiftly and promptly, but he answered them all to their total satisfaction. And in, in, and in keeping with the precepts and the concepts set out in the Holy Quran. So they got satisfied that here truly is an Imam alayhi salam. The word soon got round that they were satisfied. Various other pilgrims then came over to see him and they too put questions to him. In fact, it is said in respect of another session that Imam Jawad alayhi salam held that in a session of two or three days, according to one hadith, according to another shorter time, he answered 30,000 questions that were put to him. And all these questions were put to him in the fear that in his youthfulness he had to satisfy the ummah that he truly was an imam. The, the arguments on youthhood that we put, discussed last night were also discussed in those sessions. But of course were of no moment because his personality established, established all those factors. Indeed, after the imam salam, was moved on to Baghdad, and as we saw yesterday, was then married to Ummul Fadl, the daughter of Mahmoon. He remained in Baghdad for a full year. As you know, when a person marries a princess, he is expected to be in the palace and he is, he is expected to remain in that area. Indeed, if he marries, leave alone a princess, a rich person's daughter, the family that is affluent expects that the son-in-law will either stay with them or at least near them and that they would be able to maintain the, the, the family and ensure that the daughter lives up to the standard to which she was accustomed in her father's house. But the position with Imam Jawad salam, was different. He categorically refused to stay in the palace and said to Mahmoud, you knew what my father did. And in keeping with the practice, the sunnah of my father, I too will take a house of my own. Indeed, of Imam Jawad alayhi salam, it was said that he rented his own premises. He did not even take a place in, the, in, 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 in one of the outhouses of the palace. His argument being that my father was appointed the heir apparent. I am not. I am not an officer of the state. So I will not only have my own accommodation, I will pay for my own rent. And in that capacity then, he was able to meet the people. And the people of Baghdad, and indeed the whole of Iraq now, kept visiting him at his house. 
questions were asked and he continued answering the questions and indeed in no time the people of Iraq were now satisfied just as the people of Medina had been that he was indeed the legitimate successor to the Holy Prophet and one of the factors apart from the knowledge that he disseminated that convinced them was his conduct. Mahmoud always thought that one way to bring round Ahlul Bayt to the way of thinking of the Abbasides was to put them into the life of luxuries. He did not succeed with Ar-Ridha in any way at all. He was not only an ascetic, he taught ascetism. Not only did he teach ascetism, his own life was completely ascetic. With the result that Mahmud, instead of succeeding to convert the Imam alayhi salam, the reputation of the Imam alayhi salam was increased manifold. But as we discussed yesterday, the result was that upon the martyrdom of Ar-Ridha alayhi salam, the people themselves rose against al mamun saying, you indeed are the person who assassinated ar rida alayhi salam. And so Mamun once again had to start his machinations that we discussed the night before last. This started his machinations to appease the shares of the time by calling over Imam Jawad alayhi salam and getting him married to his daughter. Now he was able to say to the shares, look, I have no animosity against you. I have given my daughter in marriage to, to your Imam, whom I have put forward in the, in the court and given him an opportunity to prove his worth. An opportunity, as we discussed yesterday, question by question, the ones that he was asked, how he answered them, and indeed how he put forward his question. Well, so Mahmud therefore thought that he will thereby have appeased the Shias. Now the Shias having gone and visited the Imam salam, and seen his work, they were able to see in Imam Jawad salam, indeed a replica of his father Ar-Ridha alayhi salam. They were able to see Ar-Ridha alayhi salam in the youthhood youthhood of Al-Jawad alayhi salam, then perhaps 15, 16 years old and no more. <coughs> but whilst the people began to get confidence, Mamun felt that his purpose was not being served. His purpose then was that I will keep Al-Jawad alayhi salam in, in Baghdad, I will supply him with the luxuries of life, he will re lead royal life, as a prince married to the daughter of the caliph and things will gradually begin to change. That royal way of life will lead him away from spiritualism and from ascetism. He thought a younger man and raw as he was would be easier to mold despite the knowledge that he had already exhibited. But Mamun proved totally false because the, the Imam salam, would not live in the palace. He lived in his small house, entertaining people, answering questions, eating simple food, meeting poor people who kept coming to his house. And they found in him those qualities that a Ridha alayhi salam portrayed. I will not take you back to those. We discussed those last Sunday night. But the same pattern Poor people coming, joining him for a meal. Indeed, his servants sitting with him and eating with him, just as the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, lived. And al mamun gave himself time. But even at the end of the full year, he found that Al-Jawad had not changed in any manner at all. His mannerisms were exactly like those portrayed of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his progeny in the books. And indeed, those of ar Ridha alayhi salam, his etiquette was exactly the same. His worship was identical, long nights in prayer, and indeed, many a days of fasting. That was not a way of life to which Umm al-Fadl was accustomed, and even complained to Mamun about it, that I'm not accustomed to this life. Mamun said, this is the way this family is. And this is the way to which you will have to be accustomed 
but give us time we will be able to mold him time was given but time acted against mamun acted against mamun in the sense that people began to see more and more of that ascetism more and more of his getting nearer to allah and the imam alayhi salam had more and more opportunity to make the bligh even in the confines of his house only because people from far and wide came to him if he could not have access to them they had access to him but what they did find when they visited him was not only that depth of knowledge which he was prepared and willing to disseminate and teach that knowledge to the people thereby propagating the policy of education not only did he do that and narrating a hadith of the holy prophet peace be upon him and his progeny to the extent that those who visited him started to convert his his meetings into classes and the the classes being held in madinatul rasul began to be held in baghdad close to the palace of mamun in which now discussions were taking place on islamic matters on the questions of fiqh on the questions of aqaid and the answers given were being taken down and notes being made mamun thought this was getting a little out of hand <clears throat> instead of him converting imam jawad alayhi salam into that kind of princely boy whom he, he as he wanted him to be imam jawad alayhi salam was converting his people into a setting of mind which would lead them to the straight path in accordance with the teachings of ahlul bayt alayhi salam at about the same time when mamun began to feel this is a danger now because soon people will turn round and say if ar rida alayhi salam was offered khilafa then why not offer khilafa to his son who is equally competent we have tested him we have seen his mannerisms we have seen his piety we have seen his knowledge there is none to equal him indeed mamun could not resign from that fact yesterday i set out his speeches from which you could see how he praised imam jawad alayhi salam indeed how he praised ahlul bayt alayhi salam saying that indeed the first of them preached as the last of them would preach and the last of them confirmed the preaching of the first they were indeed a chain of of as indeed as indeed the imama is supposed to be and this is exactly the point sahib al hujja ajjal allah farajahu he makes that point in his dua e nudba i mention dua e nudba because it is regularly recited at least on eid days and on fridays and in that dua e nudba as sahib al hujja ajjal allah farajahu says ain al hasani ain al husain أين أبناء الحسين الصادق بعد الصادق والصالح بعد صالح الحج عليه السلام says where is now al hasan poison where is al hussein murder and then he says where are the children of hasan and hussein where are أين الأبناء الحسين and then gives the qualifications الصالح بعد الصالح والصادق بعد الصادق each one of them a pure one succeeded only by a pure one no lesser qualification would suffice and a and, and a صالح one a pious one succeeded by a pious one that is what they saw in this connection that al jawad alayhi salam with that with that truthfulness with that pureness with that piety of ar rida alayhi salam these indeed are the qualifications which mamun had drummed up when he wanted to have ummul fadl married to imam jawad alayhi salam and his courtiers were opposing him well so he found himself unable to cope with that with that personality of al jawad alayhi salam and yet the people when they visited him found him humble they thought they were visiting a prince a person married to the daughter of the caliph they found a simple man a humble man one living exactly in, in in keeping with the teachings of the holy prophet peace be upon him and his progeny polite 
not sitting before them with, with legs stretched, not sitting before them resting on a pillow, just the kind of qualities that we described of Imam Rada alayhi salam. Mamun now got worried. He now felt that the tide could well turn against him. And hence he began to soften and began to send soundings that he would be prepared for, <coughs> for Imam Jawad salam to move back to Medina. He thought he would have greater peace with the Imam salam in Medina at a distance from him. Not that that helped him much, as I hope we will discuss perhaps on Monday night. The revolutions that then took place, the political scenario that developed in the time of Imam Jawad alayhi salam and how he coped with it. Although Imam Jawad alayhi salam had an agenda slightly different from that of Imam Rada alayhi salam and we, I hope we shall compare that on Monday night. But for the moment when Mamun saw that time has come when he should separate Al Jawad alayhi salam from the people of Iraq. He sent soundings that he would be amenable to, to Al Jawad salam moving to, to Medina. And Imam Jawad salam found that eminently suitable. He thought that if he went back to Medina, he would be away from the exiges, from the ages of Mamu. He would be away from that, from that uh, magnetic field in which Mahmoud was operating and his activities were circumscribed because then he was under surveillance. He was under surveillance all the time. The pretext being that he is a prince and it's the duty of the state to protect the prince. And hence he was given guards whom he refused to have. He said nobody on my doorstep because I want people to be able to enter freely and ask me freely as the Holy Prophet peace be upon him lived. So they couldn't keep guards there but they kept people around to keep a watch. The idea really was that he should not be able to become powerful. Mamun trusting that his age will not permit him the confidence that would be required, the confidence for example that a Rida alayhi salam would have helped. Yet he wanted to take no risk. So he wanted to send him back. Imam Jawad alayhi salam, as I said, found it convenient. Firstly, because he would be away from all that surveillance. Secondly, and this was more important for him, he would be able to go back to that madrasa, to that masjid al-Nabawi in which al-Sadiq and al-Baqir were holding their classes. Those classes were now suspended because for a while a rida alayhi salam was not there. Although he resuscitated the classes immediately on becoming an imam and he used to go to those places and deliver his, 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 his speeches. But despite his age, and that, is, that was before the meeting he had, which we discussed yesterday with Yahya bin Akfam, yet once he got into, once he was brought into Baghdad, those classes were suspended. To him, those classes were important because that was the center from which Islam was to flourish. That was the center from which Al-Baqir and Al-Sadiq conducted their classes. And it was important that that madrasa should flourish. And indeed, his activities with his own people, as we shall see on Monday night, inshallah, was better, was better arranged from Medina, was more facile to handle particularly because pilgrims would come to Makkah. And so his people found it easy to meet him from Makkah. Going to Medina was convenient because everybody goes to Medina to pay homage to the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his progeny. And a number of things could be arranged. Hence, he found it very convenient to move out, of, uh, to move out at that particular time from, uh, from, from Baghdad and resettle in Medina. Indeed. As he came out, as, as he decided he would move out, Mamun escorted him with full paraphernalia, his generals, his ministers, all escorted him up to the, what is called the gate of Kufa. And at the gate of Kufa, they bid him farewell, and the Imam alayhi salam now, with Ummul Fadl, moved out of Baghdad back into Medina. <coughs> but he only had to move out of that place and his, his, his miracles started. 
as, as he had shown his miracles before, as, as we saw what happened in the court of Mahmoon last night. However, just as he moved out from the, bank, from the gate of Kufa, time for prayer, so he stopped at the house of Musayyab, a mosque there, he went to the mosque to say his prayers. And when he went to the mosque to say his prayers, he needed to make his ablution. He therefore went to a tree to make his ablution. The tree was a load tree, but a load tree which had, which had withered. It was totally dry. It was not giving any fruits at all. Indeed, it had been given up as a tree. There was but a trunk standing there no more. The Imam salam looked at it, decided he will have his wudu under that tree. He had his wudu under that tree and the water from his wudu was all sprinkled into the roots. He went to say his maghrib and all that was recorded. You can see the interest people then already were taking in him because by then his imama was more than established to the satisfaction of the ummah. Indeed, it is recorded that in his Maghrib three, prayer, three rakats, in the first rakat after Surah Hamd, he recited Surah Nasr. And in the second rakat after Surah Hamd, he recited Surah Ikhlas. And he made kunut in the second prayer after Surah Ikhlas and before Ruku. And all that was noted and observed. And then, having completed his prayers, he recited four rakat of Nawafil. And I'm setting this out to give you an idea of how much time that would have consumed. And once he completed Nawafid, he stood up to continue with his journey. <coughs> By the time he came out of the mosque, the load tree had gone, grown up, branches were already there, fruits had flourished. And indeed, people started eating the loads. And they found them so sweet that the elder people were saying, that even in the time when this tree was, was, was flourishing, the loads were not as sweet as they were now. They bade farewell to the Imam salam, who moved into Medina. And there in Medina again, again, the same classes were set up. <coughs> and students started coming back to those classes. And numerous ahadiths are today reported, particularly on tafasir of Quran, from Imam Jawad alayhi salam. And he conducted these classes in open, open to everybody, whoever wanted to come, as indeed al Baqir and al Sadiq had done. But apart from that fact, he, he restarted his contacts with the poor people of Medina, visiting them in the early hours of the night, as a Sajjad alayhi salam had done, as Amir al Mu'mineen alayhi salam used to do. That proximity and contact with less fortunate people of society. Those who needed help were able to come to him and help was being given freely as a riva alayhi salam used to do. And indeed all this in total humbleness and in total humility. There were a few consequences. For example, Ummul Fadl was not able to tolerate that life at all. In the meantime, Imam Jawad alayhi salam decided he needed progeny. He needed progeny to perpetuate the Imam alayhi salam. And he married a lady who was a descendant of Ammar Yasser. And when that happened, Ummul Fadl became absolutely exasperated. And this time she wrote a letter to her father, Mahmoud, saying, I was complaining about the simplicity with which Jawad alayhi salam lives. And you said that is the way of life to which I must be accustomed. And so I continued with that life. Now he has brought another lady in his, in, in his life. This is a descendant of Ammar Yasir. And you remember the proximity Ammar Yasir had with Amir al Mu'mineen alayhi <coughs> salam. Well, and so he, she complained to her father, saying, Please write to him and get this sorted out. Mahmoon was totally helpless in the matter. And so he wrote back a stern letter to his daughter saying, I have not got you married to Al-Jawad alayhi salam, so that I prohibit him from that which Allah has made halal. And this is the last thing that I know he will do, making haram that which Allah has made halal. 
you must accept that this is in keeping with the laws of Allah and please do not make complaints to me of this nature ever again in my life. He knew too well that he had to shut these doors to his daughter otherwise these complaints would keep coming. Indeed the matter was resuscitated but after Mamun's death as I hope we will see on Monday night. So in the meantime Umul Fadl gets dissatisfied but remains dissatisfied. This was a great gesture on the part of Imam Jawad alayhi salam because he was saying to the world his main purpose as I said was to perpetuate his progeny and it was through this through this illustrious pious lady that Al-Hadi alayhi salam was born and so this marriage was of importance to Al-Jawad alayhi salam be that as it may <coughs> and, 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 and be that the main purpose of that marriage there were other consequences also the predominant of those subsidiary consequences was this that it was very well known by Mamun and by his courtiers and indeed by the Shias in the Shiite world and this perhaps was the most important part that the Shias knew this that when the Imams alayhim salam and indeed when the Holy Prophet peace be upon him had a wife of importance and significance they did not marry another lady for example as you know so long as Bibi Khadija alayhi salam was alive the Holy Prophet never took another wife and indeed so long as Bibi Fatima Zahra Salamullahi alayha was alive <laughs> Hazrat Amir alayhi salam did not take another wife but both of them both the Holy Prophet and Hazrat Amir alayhi salam after the departure of Bibi Khadija alayhi salam and her daughter Bibi Fatima Zahra alayhi salam respectively they both married a number of wives but not in their lifetime and this was the custom with the Imams alayhi salam who followed but with Al Jawad alayhi salam despite the fact that he had married a princess who was living with him and was alive he decided he would marry another lady in other words he was making a, 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 a dogmatic categorical statement that the marriage of Ummul Fadl to him was a marriage of a princess to him and a worldly princess has no significance or import in the life of any man <coughs> to, to him that lady was like any other lady entitled to all her rights in Islam as a wife but no more that is where her rights stopped not akin to the rights of Bibi Khadija alayhi salam or Bibi Fatima alayhi salam for the reason that the status of those magnificent ladies was a spiritual status theirs was a status which had proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala indeed angels came down on them that angels came down on Bibi Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam we have already discussed in 1990 at length sorry in the year 2000 at length uh, on, on, on that particular on that particular subject there was no such comparison with Ummul Fadl at all and he made that open statement as it were that she is not at par with any person who I regard as spiritual. The Shias of the time knew therefore that this is not an individual smeared or influenced by royalty or by the, by the pedigree of, of, of the wife in any way at all. Indeed he is treading on the Sunnah of the Holy Prophet. And this is how he treated both the ladies. Simplicity of life in the homes and both ladies, particularly Ubul Fadl, required to conform as a lady to those standards that an Islamic lady, a Muslim lady is supposed to satisfy. Hijab and all other necessary concomitants of being a Muslim lady were all applicable to, to Ummul Fadl just as they were applicable to any other wife and any other Muslim lady in Medina. That did not suit Ummul Fadl at all. Yet she now was tied but the Shias were able to see that the Sunnah of the Prophet was strictly adhered to. <coughs> and indeed the poor were able to see, the Ummah was able to see that all 
that was required in an imam was fully satisfied by Imam Rawa alayhi salam in all, in all its, uh, its uh, requirements. Indeed, this fact that I put forward to you, and I have abridged it considerably because I want to move on to another subject if possible this evening, the, 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 the extraordinary events that one found in the life of uh, Imam Jawad alayhi salam. But before I do that, I wish to sum up what I was saying on the akhlaqiyat of uh, Imam Jawad alayhi salam just by saying this much. The, 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 the crux of the matter I submitted to you last night. <coughs> but to, to cap up all the additional matters I have put forward today and indeed to, 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 to summarize also in a way what we discussed last night, may I just finally say this that these matters of excellence of Al-Jawad that I have put forward to you are not confined to the books of the Shaykhan as I mentioned last night. They were, these are matters that are unanimously accepted by all Islamic scholars of that time and of today. Indeed, a number of leading Sunnite authors have subscribed to these thoughts in their own books. For example, Muhammad bin Talha a Shafi, he says in his particular book, Matalibu Su'ul, at page 239, of Imam Jawad, he says, Wa in He was indeed young in age. That is what he says. And you can see how he emphasizes that fact. Wa in kana sin, although he was young in age, Fahuwa kabirul qadr. Saghir of sin, but Kabir al Qadr, he was high in status and in his in and in, 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 in his personality and and, and, and in his position. Rafi'u dhikr and elevated in his remembrances. Indeed, those words of Muhammad bin Talha al Shafi are indeed repeated by, by Sitta ibn Juzi. No, it's repeated by, by, by Ibn Sabah al Maliki. Ibn Sabah al-Maliki, and, and that's the reference that I have put to you before. This is in Fusul al-Muhimmah, this particular reference at page 265. And he repeats those words of the Shafi'i saying, وَإِن كَانَ صَغِيرُ sin, وَهُفَوَا كَبِيرُ الْقَدْرِ رَفِيعُ الذِّكْرِ Identical words repeated. And then he says, الْقَائِمُ imama بَعْدَ Ali ibn Musa الرَّضَى وَالْوَلَدُهُ Indeed, he was the successor, al qaimul Imama. He was successor in, in the place of, of Ar-Rida alayhi salam, in the Imama of Imam Rada alayhi salam. So you can see that even these scholars, when they weighed these two personalities, found them at par, found Imam Jawad alayhi salam well succeeding and well at par with Imam Rada alayhi salam in the matters of the Imama, young in age but high in status and in position. And indeed it says, Abu Ja'far Muhammad al-Jawad an-nafsu alayhi wal-irshada lahu biha min abih kama akhbara bidhalika jama'atan min al-thiqati al-udul. Indeed, that is proof that in respect of matters of irshad, in respect of matters of guidance, and in respect of the matter of nas that I, I discussed last night, in all those matters one found that he was indeed in that silsila, in that progeny of, 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 of imama. And that comes from, from that, uh, that Maliki scholar in his, in his work, Fusul al Muhimma. But as I, as I, as I said, Sipta, Sipta ibn, ibn Juzi in his work, his work, al -fus, uh, his, his work is Tadkiratul Khawas, and at page 358, he sets out the colleges of Imam Jawad alayhi salam and he says, وَكَانَ أَلَى مِنْ هَاجِ أَبِيهِ فِي الْعِلْمِ وَالتَّقْوَى وَالزُّهْدْ وَالْجُوْهِ All those qualities of, of akhlaq you require in Imam, he categorizes them seriatim. Indeed, these now are not Ithna Ashari scholars. He, 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 he is a leading Sunnite scholar, Sifta ibn Juzi, and mentions those qualities of the Imam alayhi salam, firstly setting out his ilm, his knowledge, 
and then his taqwa, his piety, his zuhd, his, 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 his pureness and his charity, his Jew. All those qualities well set out there. And you find similar references and similar matters set out by Sheikh Muhammad Sheikhani. Sh 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 and in his work, again, a leading work, Siratul Sawa, a leading Sunnite work, that is set out. And you also find these set out in Sawai Ke Mahrika, in Sawai Ke Mahrika, they are at page 123 of, um, of uh, Ibn Hajar Makki. Indeed, indeed, in, uh, in uh, Wafayatul A'yan, Ibn al, Ibn al Khalqan mentions him as one of the Imams who succeeded al Ridha alayhi salam. He says, Abu Jafar, Muhammad ibn Ali Ridha, Ibn Musa al Kazim, Ibn Jafar al Sadiq, Ibn Muhammad al Baqir. No doubt now who is the personality we are talking about because he gives the full pedigree there. He says, Al Ma'roof bil Jawad. He was very well known as Jawad, as, 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 as the title to which we ascribe him. Ahad al Aimma ithna Asha. And indeed, he was one of the 12 Imams. So the point I'm laboring to make is that it is not that it is only our books, the Shia Ithna Ashari books, that regard him in that color. Yesterday I quoted Tabari, which is, which is a leading, uh, leading Sunnite history book, but today I have quoted half a dozen of these of these Sunnite authors who have examined Imam Jawad some of them contemporaries and, and have come exactly to the same conclusion. This is why I said both the Khasa and the Amma, indeed the entire community of the time saw him in that light. Indeed a conclusion to which they could not have, from which they could not have differed. But here they mention, <coughs> the Sunnite writers mention of his karama, of the extraordinary events that took place in, the, in his life. I wish to embark upon that tonight straight away, to save my little time tomorrow night. And maybe just a matter of two, perhaps just one matter before I go to Masai, which I do not want to delay, because tonight we remember that commander of Imam Hussain alayhi salam, Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas salawatullahi wa salamu But however, a parting note on Imam Jawad alayhi salam, and this is as much set out in Sunnite works as it is set out in our works. And it comes from Ali bin Khalid. Ali bin Khalid says that Whilst he was in Samara, it came to his knowledge and it became generally known that a Syrian has been arrested <coughs> and has been brought over from Syria to, to, to Samara. By then the headquarters of course was Baghdad. It had been shifted from, 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 uh, from Tus to Baghdad. But this event is in Samara. And at that particular time, the allegation against this person was that he professed to be a prophet. And hence the word flew like wildfire. Because when somebody professes to be a prophet, all the Muslims raise their brows and say, what is happening? Has he been arrested and what is going to happen next? What is exactly his claim? But the, 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 the governor at that time, Az Zayyad, Muhammad bin Zayyad, decided that he will lock him up. And so he just locked him up. Ali bin Khalid says, I thought this is a little strange. So he befriended the warden of the prison and decided that he would go and visit. He would go and visit this person. He did. And when he visited this Syrian, the Syrian said, I have never claimed to be a prophet. I am indeed an ardent Muslim. And I accept what Quran says, that our prophet was indeed Khatimul Anbiya, he was the last of the, uh, the seal of the prophets. There's no question about it. So, Ali says, then why have they arrested you? Why are you here? And he says, I am here only for saying the truth in favor of, of Al-Jawad alayhi salam, who they perhaps do not like, and they do not like hearing these praises of Al-Jawad alayhi salam. 
I, being un, uh, naive on that particular point, said this truth. And when I say this truth, it became the subject of my arrest. So Ali, Ali by the way, was a Zaidi. He wasn't uh, an Ifnashari, he was a Zaidi Shia. So he says to him, tell me what exactly <coughs> did you say and what exactly happened? And he said, I have been accustomed for a number of years to spend long nights in prayer. But I do not spend those long nights in prayer at home. I always go to Masjid al Amawi, and inshallah we have all been to that mosque. And inshallah, may Allah make it possible for us all to go to Sham once again for the ziyarah of Bibi Zainab alayhi salam. So he says, I would go to that mosque, not that I wanted to pray in the, the Amawi mosque, but I always prayed at the place where the head of Imam Hussein alayhi salam was kept. And when we go to the Amawi mosque, you remember, there is that place, which we are shown also, where the head of Imam Hussein alayhi salam was placed. And as you know, it is our custom that when we get to that place, we always recite ziyarat e -waris. We recite ziyarat e -waris. There is a place where we recite our salah. And then we part from that place after having paid courtesy and homage to it only for the reason that the sir of Imam Hussein alayhi salam was kept there. A place therefore consecrated. A place where Allah accepts prayers. So this is Syrian thought too. And he always went there and prayed near the head of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. What wonder that it may be for that reason that the account I am now going to put before you ever occurred. <coughs> The next thing that happened was, says one night as I was immersed in my prayers, and I always was because I wasn't concerned with what was going on around me, I suddenly saw a person standing in front of me. But I completed my prayers, and having completed my prayers, I looked at him, and he smiled at me. But when I looked at him, an O entered my body, and I could see that the zuhd, the piety, the taqwa of this personality was far beyond that I had noticed in any other person. Young though he looked, but the depth of his piety was most inspiring and impressionable. And indeed, I saw brilliance from his countenance, from his face. So I stood up out of courtesy. And when I stood up, only to extend courtesy to him and shake hands with him, he turns round to me and says, why don't you come along with me? And the Syrian says, I knew, didn't know him at all. And maybe another person might think I did a foolish thing just to accompany him. But the reverence of this personality was such that you could not do anything other than what he asked you to do. And out of sheer respect and for no other reason, I moved out with him. And he held my hand for a while. And I saw that I was moving out of Damascus. Having moved out in a few moments, I suddenly saw myself in the mosque of Kufa. I looked around and I said, this is the mosque of Kufa. He turned around to me, smiles again. And I smiled back. And he says, where, do you know where we are? And I say, Sayyidi, I know. This is Masjid al-Kufa, is it not? He said, yes, it is. I wanted to come here to pray. And as I saw you also in prayers, I thought you too might like to pray in Masjid al-Kufa. And this Syrian says, Sayyidi, what greater honor can I have than to have this opportunity of praying in this majestic mosque? And so we prayed. He prayed and I prayed. And after a while, he stands up again. And when he stood up, I stood up. And we moved out of the Sahan of Masjid al-Kufa. When he moved out of the Sahan of Masjid al-Kufa, he turns around to me and says, let us now go to another mosque. And we pray in another mosque. What does a pious man do other than move from mosque to mosque and pray all night? Indeed, that was his conduct in Baghdad, that was his conduct in Medina. Lucky was this Syrian to have this company. So he says, he held my hand again, and it was necessary, because I could not otherwise have moved at all. He held my hand. We moved. 
Suddenly he left my hand and I saw myself in Masjid al-Nabawi. We were now in Medina. He turns round to me and says, you know where you are, don't you? And I turn round and say, yes, the holy grave of the holy prophet, peace be upon him and his progeny, and said, assalamu alaikum ya Rasulullah. Well, he said, let us make the ziyarah of, of uh, the holy prophet and pray here. <coughs> So we both prayed in that mosque. After a while, he comes back to me. So I stand up again. And we moved out through the Sahan, moved out of Masjid al -Nabawi. He then says to me, let us go to yet another mosque. The night is still young, we can do another mosque. And I said, Sayyidi, I am at your disposal. He held my hand. We moved. And this time, I see the Kaaba in front of me. And he says, let us make a tawaf as we are here. So we made tawaf. And then he, we went to Maqam Ibrahim and he said, let us pray here as well. So we prayed there as well. And having prayed there, a time came when he came back to me. So we moved out of the well of, the, of Masjid al-Haram. And as we were out, he held my hand again. And where do I see myself? back in Damascus in Masjid, in Masjid Amawi. And when I saw myself there, I said, Sayyidi, we are back in Masjid Amawi. And all he replied was, yes. He took me exactly to the place where I was saying my prayers. And as I stood at my place, he shook hands with me, said, Fi amanillah, and away he went. I did not even have the courage to stop him and ask him, but who are you? Away he went. And when he went away, I lamented. But then I said, this is a grace from Allah that I should have done four mosques. One in which I am. Three more mosques <coughs> in one night. If Allah has given me that much, enough for me. If I don't know his name, I know this is a waliullah. At least a waliullah. So that he should be able to take me in this way to these auspicious places where I could pray on in that night. I continued in my prayers day in, day out. The year that followed, exactly that happened. He came again. And when he came again, of course I stood up. Now I knew what was going to happen. And again we left Damascus to Masjid al Kufa and prayed to Masjid al Nabawi, made the salutation to the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his progeny, and prayed went to Kaaba, made the tawaf and prayed and back to, 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 to Masjid al-Amawi. This time I was a little cleverer. <coughs> As he gave, gave, shook hands with me to say, Fi amanillah, I held his hand and I said, by, by the one who has given you this power, that in one night you can move from Damascus to Kufa, from Kufa to Medina, from Medina to Makkah, back to Damascus. Not only that, that power with his grace he can give you, but he gives you the power to be able to take me along with you. How much grace has Allah bestowed on you? By the power of him who gave you this power, at least tell me what your name is. And he turns to me and says, my name is Muhammad bin Ali bin Musa, bin Ja'far, bin Muhammad, bin, bin, bin Ali, bin Hussein, bin Ali ibn Abi Talib. Salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi wa ajwa'in. And so saying, he removed his hand from my hand and went away. No more questions asked. And he says <coughs> to Ali, I should have contained myself. I should have been able to digest this mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but I couldn't I did not have the capacity to assimilate it and I told a few people that this is what happened and this is truly the status of Muhammad ibn Ali ibn al-Jawad salawatullahi wa salamu alayh the word went round and the governor of Damascus came to know of this so he passed the news and they came and arrested me. This is all I have said. And what I have said is absolutely true. Never did I claim to be a prophet. I visited him 
with Al Jawad alayhi salam, saluted him and prayed at his graveside. And do that till today and recite Quran as a book revealed on the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, as the seal of the prophets. So <coughs> Ali said, I knew the, the governor and I told him I will write a letter to him. And the next morning I wrote a full letter to the governor setting out the effects. Not that the governor did not have these facts when he got the intelligence. He knew exactly what this person had claimed. They, they, they falsified, they concocted this claim of uh, this Syrian that he claimed to be a prophet. But be that as it may. When this letter reaches the governor, he writes on the reverse of it. Muhammad al Zayyat writes to Ali bin Khalid on the reverse of it. He says, Why are you writing this letter to me? Ask him to ask that very person who in one night moved him from Damascus to Kufa, from Kufa to Medina, to Makkah and back to Damascus. He should be able to get him released. And Ali bin Khalid says, When I received that letter, I wept. I said, how rude can this man get? And how arrogant can he get? I did not know what to do. So I paused to think. After a few hours, I said to myself, this is not fair. I have given hope to that Syrian that I will write to the governor. It behoves me to go and report back to him. I will not go and tell him what this governor has written because it is just arrogant. But I will go and tell him that I have written the letter. And Allah is great. And inshallah, Allah will find a way out for you. And I said, I'll go and give him words of solace. When I go to the prison, just the, the day I received that letter, when I go to the prison, I see there is a lot of halabaloo there. The army is there. Police are there. <coughs> so I go and ask people, what has happened? People appear to be in confusion. Suddenly I saw that warden, who allowed me to go and see this Syrian. So I quietly went to him and said, what is happening? He said, don't ask, I'm in trouble. He says, what is the trouble? What has happened? He said, you remember that man? I allowed you to come and see. He said, yes. He said, we had chained him. And he said, Ali ibn Khalid says, yes, you had kept him in chain. He says, he has disappeared. There is no breaking at all. All gates are closed. There is all locks are intact. The roof is intact. Indeed, the chain is intact. The chain is there on the floor and the man has gone. Ali bin Khalid says, the warden may know, may not know. I knew that the man who took him from Damascus to, to Kufa, to Medina, to Makkah, back to, back to Damascus was the very person who must indeed have taken him out of that prison. Are these challenges? that a governor of a khalif can give out to an imam of the time? In no time, in no time did the imam alayhi salam act. And the glorious part of it is that he did not even write to the imam alayhi salam. The imam alayhi salam was then in Medina, not even informed of the event. But indeed, if he did take this person from Damascus to Kufa, Medina, Makkah and back, he would exactly know what the person was doing, where he was, and what the governor had written about him. But this was the personality of these individuals. And such indeed was the personality of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. But Imam Hussein alayhi salam's policy in Karbala was a different one. It was not a policy of fighting to win the war. Because he felt winning the war may have just got the kind of consequences that prevailed in the time of his illustrious father. He therefore decided that the winning of the battle lay in losing this war and lay in martyrdom. Hence, Abbas alayhi salam was not allowed to go to fight. Since dawn, since dawn on the day of Ashura, Abbas alayhi salam went to Imam Hussein alayhi salam saying, Mawla, let me go. Let me give them a taste of my sword. Then they will come, to, then Yazid will come to know what it means to fight Al Hussein alayhi salam. And I'll finish, I'll finish these cowards in no time. Imam Hussein alayhi salam says, Abbas, you are my commander. I cannot let you go at so early a time. Let my other companions start the battle. We will go later on. 
A few hours later, Abbas goes back to Al Hussein and says, Mawla, let me go now. And Imam Hussein salam, says, Abbas, not now. You are my commander. But the time comes when Abbas goes to the Imam salam, and says, Sayyidi, you keep telling me you are my commander. Where is now the army of which I am commander? All you companions have gone. The kith and kin have gone. Aun and Muhammad have gone. Qasim has gone. Where is the army left? Let me go now. <coughs> this is indeed the time for me to go and, and fight. My father used to tell me, Ya Sayyidi, you remember that I am going to be his representative in Karbala. Let me have a chance to satisfy my father that I indeed was. And Imam Hussain alayhi salam says, Abbas, you have been to me exactly how our father was to the only prophet, peace be upon him. You do not need to satisfy him or anything. Abbas, have patience. You and Fai and I will fight together. When I decide to take Zulfiqar, I'll take you along. We two brothers will fight together and show these enemies what, what, how we can fight them out. Uh, but Abbas says, Mawla, let me go before you. I must save you. I cannot allow one spear to fall on you whilst I am alive. Imam Hussain looks at that loyalty and love of Abbas and only weeps. In the meantime, Sakina comes along and says, Oh, Uncle Abbas, we are so thirsty. The children are so thirsty. I have brought my water skin. I have brought my milk. Can you please go and have this? water skin with this mesh filled with water. I have promised the children that I am coming to you. I have promised them that Abbas will not come back without water. My uncle will never come back without water. Indeed, I have asked them to sit and pray. You go and get us water. Now Abbas alayhi salam looks at Imam Hussain alayhi salam. And Imam Hussain alayhi salam looks at Abbas alayhi salam. The last exchange of gazes between these two loving brothers. And indeed, Imam Hussain alayhi salam turns to us at Abbas and says, Abbas, follow the instructions of your knees. Go and get water and take the sword out of the sheath. Abbas looks at Imam Hussain, says, Sayyidi, that is my sword. And he says, yes, indeed. Take this spear. You are not going to fight now. We will fight together. Take the spear. The spear is enough for you. And Abbas goes. But with that spear, in a twinkling of an eye, Abbas conquers for us. And his horse is in the water. Indeed, Abbas picks the water in a palm pool. The water drops.